All right, before we begin this video, a little disclaimer about the subject matter of this video. The topics in this video are not mutually exclusive. They are not always A or B or black or white or yes or no. When we talk about grinds and grinding deeper to reduce more material, to reduce stiffness, to increase the stain and drop tone, this may not always happen when you grind deeper and grind more away, depending on where along the reed you do it. As we grind away reed material, we're decreasing stiffness and we may be lowering the tone, but if we grind away a whole bunch or if we grind away a lot towards the end, we're also decreasing the weight, so we're raising tone. So just because you grind deeper doesn't always mean that you'll drop the tone. You may grind deeper and your tone may go up a little bit or stay the same and your sustain may increase. So the topics in this are not black or white or yes or no. You're just It's going to come down to knowing your material and knowing your read material and knowing your lengths, your widths, your tapers, and your stiffnesses and how they relate to each other. Because ultimately, all these topics that I talk about in this video relate to each other and work with each other and everything on the harp affects everything. So I hope you enjoy it, this video ramble. A friend of mine asked, how is it that you can have a harp in C2 that's two inches long and a harp in C2 that's four inches long? How is that? Can you go over a few of the variables in that? Well. To start off, um, one of my favorite makers, Bert Sev, once commented, everything affects everything. And that's very true. There are a ton of variables that go into a harp, but let's, let's attempt to break that down a little bit more than what that is. Now, if we think of the tone a harp makes, higher or lower, it's relative. And I'm going to put these in my own words. I'm not a scientist. Um, that the higher the tone, the faster the reed's vibrating. The lower the tone, the slower the reed's vibrating. The sound wave on a lower harp is a lower sound wave. The sound wave on a higher harp is a higher sound wave. It, it bounces faster, if that's a correct explanation of that. We can see that here is a harp reed. I don't remember the exact thickness of this, but if it's longer, and just imagine this is an analog for our crimp. I'm just holding it firmly with a pair of pliers. If we pluck it, it's going very slowly. I'll put this down by my microphone. You might hear, kind of hear it a bit. As we go and shorten the reed, there it's vibrating quite a bit quicker. It may not be as apparent on this video because the rolling shutter effect, I think is what it's called. We go a little bit shorter. We're going very much quicker. As we get shorter, the reed vibrates quicker and quicker. There we're going very fast. You can actually hear that tone. It's vibrating very fast now. And we notice as we increase our length, which increasing your length just allows more weight against the reed, against the given stiffness that a harp is, the sustain gets longer. And as we get shorter, the sustain gets lower. As we get very short, our sustain goes and it's done. Now, there's a whole, whole bunch of things to think about here. I can have this given reed thickness vibrating at this specific frequency. Um, if I go with a thicker reed, say, here, I'll just give two examples of ver two very similar length harps that I make. This one here is an A1 sharp. The reed thickness is 0.020 spring steel. Actually, that is, yes, that's A1 sharp. It has a fairly thin reed. Here I have one of about the same, same length. That's a D2, which is a higher note. The one that I did in D2, the higher one, is quite a bit thicker. It's this one's 0.020 thickness of an inch. This one from this dimension is 0.025. So it's a thicker reed. So that thicker reed, if it's thicker from the side, it's allowing a lot more stiffness. And it feels different as well. The lower one that's in 0.020, that's a thinner reed, has more sustain. It feels a lot more flexible. This one of the same length, 
feels a lot more springy. There's a lot more resistance, a lot more spring to it. Now I can take this same one that's in D2 and drop it down to this note of A1 sharp if I were to make it longer. Or another thing we can think about is even with a given thickness of a reed, you can drop a tuning just by having more weight. Here is a Glazerin Phantom. This is actually a mini Phantom. There's the note the reed produces by itself. Now we can add weight to the trigger here and drop the tone. It comes with a little magnetic ball. So we're adding weight to the trigger. So we're dropping tone just like that, just in that format. We're gonna stop and take a sip of water here. So we have a few different variables and we're gonna get into this way further than this. Um, this may be a very long video of the thickness of the reed being different, causing it to be higher or lower, and also the weight that's on the trigger. Like if this trigger here was a lot longer as well, it would have a lot more leverage if it was longer because it'd be waving back and forth, pulling down on this reed harder. Now, if this trigger was super long, it would cause the reed to become unstable. Now, I've done some drawings. Apart from just the thickness of the reed, the thickness of the reed material, there's a lot of other things that can affect the tone or the pitch of the instrument. And one, our first one, I, I would say, would be the length and thickness of the reed. You can have two different reeds that are the same length that create two very different tones. The higher one being the thicker reed. Then if we look at the reeds from this dimension, not from the side, but from this dimension, the way that they taper has an effect on it. Here we get into that. Everything uh, affects everything. If we look at this first taper here, or say we look at no taper at all. I don't know where that paper went, but say we look at a reed that were to have no taper at all, say it was just a straight line across there, it would probably be in a lower tuning because at the back of the reed we have all this stiffness and then we have more weight up front. And as we taper the reed, we'll look at this top dimension first, this reed has a little bit of taper. It's wider at the back and it just has a little bit of taper. It's going to probably be, and there's gonna be more factors than this, it's gonna probably be a lower tuning than a reed that has this or this profile because we have our the, the stiffness or the springiness of the reed all back here. And as we go down it, we start reducing the material. As we reduce the material, we're reducing the weight of it. And we're also reducing the stiffness. The wider a reed is, the more stiff it is. So this reed here, if it was the same exact thickness from this dimension, but we look at it from this dimension, this reed here with this taper would be lower than this one. This one would have more sustain. The more we get to an unprofiled, just straight stick, like if we were to have a reed that was this shape with no taper at all, the more reeds tend to get unstable because you want a little bit more stiffness behind what's in front of it vibrating, if that makes any sense. Find my drawing again. Now, as we taper it more and more, the tuning comes up because the harp vibrates faster. We have more stiffness back here and less weight up front, so less leverage against the reed. And as we taper more and more, you'll notice that your sustain is less because you have less, less um, stiffness, um, this is going to be a complex video to make because it's hard to think and hold this, but the more stiffness we have back here and the less weight we have, the less sustain we'll have. I'm going to show one of my old harps that has almost no taper. It has quite a bit of sustain. It's not very loud and it's not very high either. But getting back on track, the more we go into a wedge shape, the higher the tuning goes. But in general, in my own making experience, I don't wanna to go too wedge shaped because I find that harps get higher, higher in tuning, but they get lower in sustain. They have a really high decay rate, which, I, which is what I call 
the sustain of the harp. Um, it doesn't sustain well. Now, there are harps with a wedge shape that have really good sustain because they've been ground in another dimension that we'll get into. If we look at the side profile of a reed, like not a reed from this dimension, but from this dimension, from the side of the reed, you can have a totally unprofiled reed in this dimension, or you can start reducing it in this dimension as well. We was reducing from the top view, we was reducing in this dimension. You can also affect tuning by reducing in this dimension. Most, most harp reeds I see are just like this. They are, the reed is one thickness, looking at it from the side, not from this dimension, but one thickness all the way down. Now, some makers will taper this, and this adds sustain in some, in some effects, and it also adds a flexibility. So you can have a wider reed that has a better sustain um, in, a, in a harsher taper or more of a taper if you're reducing amongst this. Imagine also you'll notice some to, some makers will put a dip in there. They're actually caught reducing the, the width of the reed at the base. So you're, you're taking away a little bit of springiness and you're dropping the tuning down and you're adding sustain. You're slowing the reed down because you're taking a little bit of the springiness away. So we have these reductions from the side. I believe in swords. This is called traditionally made Western swords, and I'm not an expert on swords. I might do a little bit of backyard cutting, but I believe this is called distal taper. Just for the fun of it, this is a Valiant Armory Bristol. This is an actual sword made for cutting. You should never cut with swords that are uh, stainless steel or cheap mall swords. This is an actual sword that's actually distally tapered. We see it's tapering in this dimension just like a jaw harp reed. But also, that distal taper I'm talking about is from the side. It's thicker here and reduces along this all the way up. And if we strike this, it actually vibrates like a jaw harp reed. It flexes. It's a good sword is made to flex. And we see this is the center of percussion. Up here, this is the actual place you want to cut with it. Similar to a jaw harp reed, it flexes and it kind of, you can kind of hear it making a tone. We'll put this over here so I don't hurt myself. Now, progressing beyond that, we have length, we have width, we have taper, we have this distal taper or reduction of the thickness in this dimension. Here we have a giant cutting jaw harp reed in this dimension. Now, one thing to keep in mind if you're making harps, if you're grinding off this dimension, on springs, springs are made to vibrate. All of the uh, grinds need to be gradual. So you never want to do a harsh angle. You would never want to do a harsh angle down like that because that is going to create an area where it will break over time, probably. Now, another thing we can think about here, we've talked about length, width, uh, thickness, um, hardness as well. If we have a harp reed like this. Now, the spring steel I buy has a rock wall hardness. Some of it is 44, 45, uh, 48 seems to work really well. The harder the reed is, the uh, less flexible it'll be, the more spring it'll have. So that's another factor that will influence how the harp sounds, how the harp plays, how the pitch that it'll make. The other thing that I wanted to touch base on is grinds. If we look at a reed, from the side, from the top, then we look at it from the end. We're just gonna call this a cross section. All my terms may not be correct. These are my best representations of it. If we start looking at cross sections, like a reed from the end, just like we would look at a sword from the very end, we see all these different profiles of grinds. Here we see, it's like a hexagon. It's like a knife blade, but on both sides, or a sword blade where we have, has two different grinds on it. Here we have a little bit steep, or a little bit more shallow of a grind. So if we look at this one, these two reeds here are the same width at a given place we're doing a cross section, but there's a whole lot more material to this one than there is to this one. Here, here the grind is a lot shallower. If we look down here, if we were to exaggerate that, stretch it out wider here, 
we have a lot less material because we ground it away. So a reed that has this grind here is going to be stiffer. It's going to have a higher tone than this grind here. Here we have what I would call a chisel grind. Some people would call it flat. This is basically, if we look at half of it, this is how a chisel is ground. This is, this is my preferred way shape for the harps that I make, but there's tons of different grinds. Here we have quite a bit more material than we have here. So this is going to affect the sound differently than this. This may cause this steep angle here, leaving a lot of that reed material, a lot of that stiffness, is going to cause the reed to, to perform higher. It's going to have it more spring to it. If we look down here, here's just a more exaggerated view of that. This is more of what your reed cross section or one that I make is going to look like. We look down here, we have what would be called, I believe a convex grind. There's a more steep convex grind. So we have a lot of harp reed material left here. And this one is going to be a little bit higher because there's a little bit less reed material that can be. And this one would be, or I'm sorry, the less reed material that we have, the lower it's going to be. The more reed material we have, if we have more reed material, more stiffness, it's going to be higher. The less reed material we have left there, the more the tone's going to drop. Um, and we have this down here, which should be a diamond shaped cross section. We see this at the end of reeds like Morsing. You'll look, they turn into almost a perfect triangle. So that's going to be perform differently as well because not only are we reducing in the stiffness of the reed by re by taking away more metal. We're also affecting the weight. It weighs less because we're removing more more material. And not all reeds will be one grind all the way down. A lot of reeds are like this or like this. Some of the Indian Morchang are like this. Some of the Morsing are like this. Or you have harp reeds that are a combination of all of them. They might start off unprofiled or with this converting to this and then going into a convex and ending in that triangular cross section. I've seen before where they start off unprofiled, just a rectangle like this, then converting to the convex grind. And then at the end, making the triangular cross section. So, which is a really complex process to do because instead of grinding one angle all the way down, you have makers who are changing the different grinds. Like this, I would classify as um, unprofiled, convex, triangular cross section. So you, all that extra work sometimes results in a harp that has a good balance of really great stiffness, really good sustain. And this is a D2. This is by a foaming call. This is a D2. Here's my D2, which is much shorter, but it's a different style, a grind of reed, different thickness of reed, and also different reed material. This reed material is actually titanium. This is a high carbon spring steel. Here's my D2. Here's the foam and cob. Foam and cobs are absolutely spectacular, but just listen to the sustain it has from the combination of the different grinds. And it's longer. Titanium isn't as hard as steel. Very, very long sustain or a low decay rate is what I would call it for a harp in D2. Now, other things we can think about are the trigger orientation. We've talked about how adding that magnetic ball to a trigger or loop or adding any type of weight. Um, some harps have solder bits here to weigh them down. Sometimes you can even take beeswax and stuff it in. And I encourage people to do this because it's a non-permanent way of experimenting around with how you can drop the tone of a harp. You can take beeswax and you can press it into this trigger loop and you can actually shave off a little bit too. You can raise to a note. It's a good way for people who don't have a shop to tune untuned harps. But if you weigh the trigger down, it's going to add extra weight. So it's going to slow down the reed. Here we see another style of, here. here's a, a, drawing, a drawing of a trigger that just has a loop here. Here we have a drawing of a trigger that has a spiral here. The spiral has extra weight. If we were to unroll this spiral, this trigger would probably be this long. So we have all this extra weight on here. So this 
it, if we have the same exact read, if we do this versus this, this is going to be lower than this is. And comparatively, if I can use comparatively in a sentence, if I were to take this to a grinder, and this is actually how I tune my instruments, I will grind off a small amount of the trigger to reduce weight to raise up to my note. Now, keep it in, keeping in mind, when you weigh something down, when you weigh down a reed, you're slowing it down. So you're causing the volume to drop a little bit and sustain to increase. As you remove metal, your sustain is going to go down, but your volume goes up and your tone goes up a little bit because that reed's moving faster and the reed's actually more powerful because you're not weighting it down. You can also make a harp lower just by making the trigger longer. Not only, not only do we have extra trigger length up here, it has extra weight of the extra length and we also have this extra leverage against it. We have this trigger that's out here and it has this extra leverage instead of being a little short trigger that doesn't have a lot of leverage against it because as the reed vibrates, it's vibrating back and forth, but the trigger's moving back and forth too a little bit. If we have the trigger up here, it's vibrating back and forth. It has all this extra leverage, so it's pulling on the reed more back and forth. Now, you don't want to go and make a, a, a reed trigger super, super long because the longer it is, the more leverage it has, but also the more unstable it causes it to become. Other things we can think about is most harps are either at a 90 degrees, slightly inward or slightly outward. But as we go outward, it causes the harp tone to drop a little bit as well, the tuning to drop a little bit because it has more leverage. You, um, you have less leverage at a 90 and more leverage as you go out straight. But as you go out straight, it really begins to slow the reed down and really begins to perform not quite as stable. Now, there's a ton of different ways people do triggers, a ton of different trigger shapes, and all of that affects it. Now, having, this is a recurve trigger, having this is going to cause the harp to behave differently as well. As we bring the, and here we see something that's really recurved in. As you bring the recurve in, we brought the recurve out, we dropped the tone a little bit, and you never want to go extreme one way or another. As you bring the reed back in, if we were to say this is the trigger as we bring the trigger back in, the sustain is going to go down a little bit because it doesn't have as much leverage, and also the tone is going to go up because it doesn't have that leverage slowing the reed down. A good balance of this I've seen is in instruments, if you're going to recurve it and make to the makers out there, to people who are aspiring to be makers out there, if you recurve it, keep a little bit of this weight right at the knee bend or past it. It, it gives it, it for me, it, uh, I've done this three or four times on harps I've made. It gives a good balance of stiffness. I either like this or at a 90 or a variance of one way or another. And when you're building harps, you kind of feel out each instrument and what does it need? Does it need the grind change? Does it need the trigger, a little bit of material removed off the trigger? What does the harp need? So every harp, there's no standard way of doing a harp that results in the best. And now we're just getting into maker's theory or my theory. Um, every instrument behaves differently and everything affects everything. So these, this was just a probably 20 some minute ramble on how length and width and tuning and weight and grind affects the instrument. And just for an added bonus, I'm just going to go in to one of my things that I like to do on reeds and all these are valid ways of do it, doing reeds. And it's all going to depend on your thickness and your material and the hardness of the material and your width and your taper. But my favorite shape for my making is about that right there because as I hand grind reeds or hand sharpen reeds, we have, you have minor, very minor variances. And I always know the back plane or the blade of the edge of the reed will be right here. So if I'm at center and there's some type of variance, I can get one side off a little bit. But that's, we're getting into rambles upon rambles upon rambles. It'd probably be better for a live ramble. Anyways, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I'd love to hear them. Uh, be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more harpery. Keep your harps clean, keep them dry, keep them oiled. I love you. Adios. And another much longer, much different harp in a different length.
Oh, my God.